It's been a while now, but I was an intern at a church in Houston, and we had a school of 27 little kids. And I was excited because we were going to take them down to NASA, south of Houston, to see all the displays of our space program. I wanted them to understand the epic nature of everything that we've accomplished through our, that program. And we, at the time, it's a long time ago, the Saturn V rocket was displayed outside. That's the big rocket from 67 to 1972 that took the Apollo groups up to the moon. It's the kind of rocket, it was the, that class of rockets that took Neil Armstrong for his first step on the moon. And I, I was standing there by that Saturn V rocket, and the kids that were in our group that were right close to me, I was blabbing on and on trying to make sure they understood the significance of what they were seeing. They had other rockets around. There was a little Mercury rocket, which was from the earlier stages of the program. And, they, and, and while I'm trying to tell them the significance of this rocket, and it's, lo it's longer than a football field, and it, takes all, it took all this fuel, and it took these men, and it was a huge program. These little kids are kind of jerking on the pant leg saying, Vicar, Vicar, can we go to the playground over there? It's like, what? You're standing by history. As a pastor and as a Christian, I sometimes feel that way about myself and about all of us when we're around the holidays. Christmas and Easter. I feel like sometimes we're thinking, that Easter dress doesn't look good on her. Or, you didn't wear the white suit you wore four years ago. Why? Why not? Why didn't she come home or stay very long with us for Easter? My deviled eggs didn't turn out. Uh, we got all these things that we're focusing on, and preachers do it too, like the, now he's ha having to hold a microphone, right? And how was your Easter? Well, the weather was kind of okay out there at the sunrise. We, we think about the playground, even things more serious like it's my first Easter without her or without him. But the meaning that what we're standing by at Easter, the meaning of Easter, we don't want to miss. We want to come back from our playgrounds, call our minds and our hearts back, and just contemplate the epic nature of the empty grave of this one man. It's what separates Christianity from all other religions of the world that proclaim they are the truth. This one proclaims, yours and mine proclaims, he was dead and he's alive again. And it means everything to us about our lives, our identity, our destiny, our peace. Everything springs from that empty grave. There's lots of places in the New Testament especially that talk about the resurrection of Christ and what it means. One of them is that it means you too will rise from the dead and live forever with body and soul someday. Another one is that, you, that the resurrection means that when he paid for our sins, that God the Father accepted the payment. That resurrection from the dead validates it. But today there are two in the little passage I chose. It's a passage written by one of the apostles, the guy that wrote half the New Testament, and a, and, a, and a sixth of the Bible, the Apostle Paul, and he wrote a letter to the Philippians while he himself was incarcerated and fearing being executed. Paul wrote the Philippians in Philippi, up in Macedonia. And this is what he says, and you've got it printed for you so you can look at it. And there's two, two things we take about the resurrection of Christ, how it changes. It's so much more than the surface of Easter. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the Ten Commandments, the law, but that which is through faith in Christ 
the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and then participating in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead myself. There are two, as we stand by the Saturn V rocket, the empty grave of Jesus, there are two, two truths here that I want to make sure you, the rest of Easter Day and beyond you are thinking about. They're here in the Word of God. The first one is God makes us right as a gift inside of ourselves. He makes things right. He gives us righteousness. We don't often use that word. The world isn't familiar with it. If they use it, it's usually to condemn religious people for being self-righteous. But the, we're all searching for it. We're all searching as human beings for that sense of being okay or being right inside. If you are a secularist, you struggle to think that it's found in God. You might think that to be right, to vindicate your life, that it mattered, that it was important, that it was right, you need to accomplish some things. You need to accomplish your dreams, your ambitions for college or for sports or for entertainment or for a band or whatever. You may want to find it in accomplishing a certain amount of wealth by a certain age. You, people grab all kinds of things in, when they're secularists to try to feel right about themselves. You might think that to feel right about yourself, you need everybody else to feel right about you and to treat you right. And so you try to find it in the social world to also, and you want social justice. <clears throat> you may, if you're religious like Paul was, want to find it in getting it right, in working hard at being good in whatever you've come to believe is good. As a Jew, Paul, there was a pathway for a, a man to be a Pharisee and a and to learn the, the words of the Old Testament and to memorize them. And you can still see it in Judaism today, and you can see it also in Christian churches, and you can see it all over in all the world religions. People trying to be right by their mystical prayers, by their moral, moralism, by their adherence to, to whatever it is their religion defines as being right. And Paul said, that's garbage compared to knowing Christ who gives us a righteousness from God because every secularist and every religionist falls short of feeling right inside and we all know it. We're just not going to get there on our own and that's why Jesus came. He said it is finished from that cross because he had lived the perfect life and he had died the innocent death in that empty grave. He, he came to life Again, to say, now I give it to you as a gift. What God saw we, would, we lost and could not do when Adam and Eve fell into sin and we all became their, their children. When God saw that, that, he said, I've got a fix-it plan and I'm going to fix it. Because they're not going to be able to fix it, but they're going to spend their whole lives trying. Bless their hearts. I'm going to fix it. And when Jesus rose from the dead, if you're standing there at that empty grave at Easter, you want to say with Paul, there is my righteousness from God. It's a gift, and we receive it by faith. That's what that verse says right in the middle. It says a righteousness from God that, that we get on the basis of faith. Faith is just trusting that God did it all for us. It's beautiful. It's liberating. It crushes self-righteousness, but it, what rises out of the ashes is love and peace and and humility and commitment and goodness and true morality based on a love that's growing in your heart because you know how much God loves you and he also loves the people around you. And it's a forgiveness and a grace that permeates every relationship and drives you to live in the light of the empty tomb. That's the rightness. And everything is right by Christ, not right because humanity has created it right. You don't need social justice as much as you just need peace in Christ. And then you love people along the way on your journey. The second thing that Paul is saying is that he wanted to live in the power of the resurrection. 
that the that you're standing at the at Easter, you're standing at the empty grave, and there's a power that's coming out of the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead, a power to for you to be able to deal with your demons and to live in the power of that resurrection. And what is he talking about? Recently, with a whole group of people, uh, my wife and I got to go to Israel to see the Holy Land. First time in my life. I'm 60 years old. And uh, one of the questions that I think is unique that friends around family and church have asked the whole, ever since we got back is, what was the one moment that, that, that means the most to you from that trip, that journey? And it's kind of hard because there are several. But today on Easter, as I think about the one moment, that when we went to this place called the Garden Tomb, which is very close to where the area within, you know, the area where Jesus was crucified, nobody knows exactly where, but it's about as big as, as the, the space that you can see here with your eye, that where the Easter egg hunt is, where I am, inside this fence, all these buildings right here. He was crucified somewhere in that area. So if you're at one site in that area that they think this might be the spot, or you're that one, to me that's irrelevant. You're like really close, right? You're in the vicinity. And so there's this place that Christians have purchased that has an ancient 2,000-year-old, at least 2,000-year-old empty tomb. And it's in a garden. And near there is a, is a cliff with a hilltop that could have been a place where they crucified people. So you're really close, right? So the, at this place... They have presenters, and as you're sitting there in the little bleachers, they're telling you why we think this might be the place where Jesus was crucified, right over there, and this is the tomb that he rose from right over here. And they're telling you, and this woman, which was telling us the story, she worked there, had this beautiful English accent. Hard not to listen to that, right? And so she's telling why, why we think this might be Joseph of Arimathea's garden that he owned and this empty grave you're about to see might be the one Jesus' body actually lay in. Well, the moment that was so beautiful and so encouraging to me because she sees thousands and thousands of people every year was, and she was obviously doing what every one of their guides was taught to do. She, after her case, our case that this might be the places that live you know, on these bullet points, she said, but really whether it's this place or not doesn't matter. What matters is that the grave of Christ is empty. That's what matters. He's risen. And she said, because he's risen, we are forgiven and we will rise too. And we can live in the joy and the peace of knowing Christ Jesus. If you remember anything, she said, about visiting the garden tomb, remember that it doesn't matter if this is the place. It matters that Jesus is risen from the dead. That is the beginning of what it means to live in the power of the resurrection. Now, I told you people ask, what's that one moment on your journey? I want to ask you the question. What's the one moment on your journey of life that means the most? We've got some big moments, right? Some of them are very joyful. Our birth, the birth of our children, our wedding day. Some of them are very difficult. The death of our most loved one, right? Uh, getting fired from a job, having a heart attack, having your house flooded when you get home from vacation full of water, right? Having a business burned down, right? We have some moments but those are the mercury rocket with the little playground around them. All of those, good or bad. The one moment that God wanted from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Joseph, the one moment he wanted to be the greatest moment in your life is the resurrection of his son when it dawned on you. The meaning and the significance was that he brought you a righteousness that he gave you as a gift. Between you and God, one-on-one, -on -one, he made you right. With him, with yourself, with your parents, with your community, with your kids, he made you right by giving you his own son. And that brings you power. That brings you the power to have hope 
when you're sad about your own life that's going to be short. That has power to give you love when you're tempted to be so angry at a person you cannot let them off the hook. That's the power to let you have a, a sense of confidence and strength knowing that you're going to live forever when you face the aging and demise of your own body. That is the power of the resurrection. Not a person here, including me, experiences it perfectly because we're still sinners struggling. But let's be experiencing it some. And let's be striving the way Paul did. And these words right here, the next thing he said was, not that I've already attained this all perfectly, but he said, I strive to leave behind the, thing, the, the stinking thinking of the past. And he goes, I lean forward. I lean into the good news of the gospel for which God has called me heavenward. So you're, you're going to have somebody ask you, they're not going to ask you what's the greatest moment on your journey to Israel or your journey in life today, probably, unless they were here with you. <laughs> but they're going to ask you, how was your Easter? And the next day or two, somebody's going to say, how was your Easter? Don't say that guy droned on and on at its Easter sunrise. It was really a drag. <laughs> say it was fantastic because I learned again the resurrection of Christ makes me, gives me righteousness from God and gives me the power to live a life above our problems. Just say, I live in the power of the resurrection because of Easter, it was fantastic. God bless you all. Have a great Easter. And remember, live in the power of the message of the gospel.